Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the How To Academy. My name is David Malone, and it's my pleasure this evening to talk to Elsa Pancharoli, who is a paleontologist at Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. Evening, Elsa. Hello. And she's also the author of a rather beautiful book, The Earth, A Biography of Life. And it is a lovely book. Your, your publishers did a beautiful job, and it's, it's full of wonderful crib sheets, um, which is very useful for people like me. <laughs> it's got a, quite a unique sort of uh, illustrative style, very graphic. Oh, it is. It's absolutely beautiful. And it's full of, uh, I'm not going to stick to do one, but just it's, it, whoever public, the publishers, who are they? Green. Uh, so, yeah, Green. They did a really quite... beautiful job. It's, it's such, such a pleasure to read. Um, now, the thing is, you, you say it's 49 incredible, 47 incredible organisms, but it's not just an ABC, is it? I mean, Tell us why you picked them, because uh, unless I'm very much mistaken, there's all kinds of themes which run through the book. Yeah, I mean, I realise there's a lots, of, lots of books that are structured around the 100 greatest organisms to do this or 50 places to see before you die. Um, but, I mean, the fact that I've chosen a number of organisms is really just a way to open, open windows into periods of time and huge changes in the development of life and the development of our planet. So the organisms are really just a mechanism in order for it to tell stories, to tell the story, the big story, of course, which is runs through the whole book, which is about the planet itself and how it goes from essentially being, you know, dust floating through uh, the solar system, you know, coalescing all the way through to being the world that we know now um, and the sort of uncertain future that we face. Um, but of course that, that's an absolutely enormous story to tell and lots of people have tried to tell it. it's very difficult to tell that and difficult to tell it in a digestible way I mean it would take a million years to tell that story so I, I wanted to use the organisms really as as a way to make it digestible so that you can you're learning about a particular uh, creature or plant or insect but more than that you know that's really a springboard to talk about what does that animal mean you know what does it signify for example you know was it one of the first things to fly did it mark the beginning of, of a whole new ecosystem um you know did it change the face of the earth in some way um, and all of them have been selected for those reasons so there's always something much bigger behind the, the choice what are some of the themes because there are there are i mean there are there are themes of mass extinctions I mean, I was, if if there was a villain in this story if a, you know a victorian villain with a with a waxed mustache it would surely be the volcano because <laughs> every time every time life gets cracking in this story there's this curtain that comes out and then there was a massive um, volcanic eruption and a nuclear winter and everyone died yeah well yeah when when people think about evolution they kind of think that it must all be about um you know diversifying and the origins of things but yeah, you're right. Mass extinctions are just as important in, in the history of life as, as the beginnings. Um, and in fact, they really have shaped the, the whole pattern of life on the planet. You know, the, which, which groups have flourished, which groups have, um, have been replaced. It all tends to come down to mass extinctions. And we've, we, a lot of us are familiar with the big ones, uh, particularly the one that's, uh, that did in the non-bird dinosaurs. But that's actually, that's not even the biggest. I mean, there are five really major ones, but there are actually multiple smaller mass extinctions that have taken place throughout time. And every time they, they do reshape the planet and often put a new sort of top dog in place um, at, at that time period. Um, let's talk about one of the, I mean, the, you've obviously chosen to be surprising and some of them really are jolly surprising. I mean, the very first one, Charnia, um, it's the first animal and then, and then you tell us, but it grows like a plant. Yeah, Charnia is a fantastic uh, one. I mean, it's, and it's a British fossil uh, as well, which is, I think, really, really exciting, you know, for, for the British readers. Um, yeah, it looks, what does it look like? I mean, it looks like some kind of strange fern. It's actually unlikely to be a plant. It's, it's certainly, we think it's an animal, but it's unlike any animal that we know today. Nothing grows like that. Nothing lives like that. Um, and we only really know it from these strange impressions in rocks. Um, it doesn't even have like a kind of branching structure that we see in the world today. I mean, it's really something quite unique. And yet at one point it was, the, you know, one of the dominant animals on the planet. Um, so yeah, it, it's a great uh, organism. So it was really, I chose it particularly because it does mark this beginning of 
complex animals, even if they're not animals as we know them. And there's also just, it makes you realize that, that the divisions that we think of as natural, like there are plants and plants like this and animals like this, that these things weren't all sorted out. They hadn't been divvied up. I mean, for a plant, for an, an animal to grow like a plant, to add bits onto itself, like a plant, just seems, well, it's not what you expect. <laughs> Yeah, quite. And, and this uh, certainly that's something that strikes me and continues to strike me. I mean, I might be a researcher, but I'm still constantly surprised by the things I'm learning and the things I learn from other researchers. And that, yeah, as you point out, that is one of them. I mean, another one that I love, I love, I love fungi. I love fungi and mushrooms. And one of the things that I particularly love about them is that, again, they're not plants either. They're actually more closely related to us. Um, and they're another incredibly important organism on our planet. Um, so, so they're also in there. Yeah, you, you, you have prototaxites, um, Ooh, yeah. which is a, a fungus as tall as a house. Yeah, it's as tall. I think I say it is as tall as two giraffes. Uh, you know, my my Google search on my computer is just filled with me trying to work out how, what to compare things to. How tall is a giraffe? How much water is in a bathtub? You know, um, so it's approximately as tall as two giraffes or, or a house, but it is a fungus. Like a I heck mean, of a mushroom. Yeah, it would have looked kind of like just a great big pole almost. It probably didn't really have any branches on it. And, and if you imagine a plant, our planet back then, the, it did have some animals on it. But when I say animals, I mean uh, the first sort of insect life. Well, they weren't insects technically, they were arthropods. So they've got exoskeletons. Um, so they're crawling around on the, on the floor. But apart from that, there's really no other animal life. It's just, you know, these strange giant mushrooms like poles everywhere um, and some of the very earliest like lichens and algae and plants and I mean I think if you if you were to you know land on, on the earth at that particular time you wouldn't necessarily recognize it was our planet at all. So there were there were the forerunners of insects were, were on the land by that point? <laughs> That's right. Um, so the, I've chosen a few organisms that are the kind of firsts. And of course, the first to to leave the water and come onto land is, is of course, significant for all of us because it's, they're establishing the ecosystems that we, of course, now rely on and that we are the product of as well. So the very first animals to come out are the invertebrates with exoskeletons. Um, but they had to tackle the kind of difficulties of not being in water. Obviously, the biggest one being gravity. Um, so, you know, they have to figure out a way to deal with the fact that, they, you know, they're constantly being dragged down. Um, and also how to breathe is another thing. Um, I've chosen an animal um, about to talk about this subject. I've chosen an animal called Pneumodesmus, which was, I mean, if we saw one, it basically is a millipede. It looks like a millipede. Um, and this was one of the first creatures to live on our planet and to live above water on our planet. Um, so it signifies an incredibly important development in the history of life on Earth. Um, is that one of those hideous, enormous insect things? Ah, no, so Pneumodesmus was a, a very small millipede. That's so right. nothing to be frightened of. Good. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Well, unless you're frightened of millipedes anyway. But by the time you get a few million years later into the Carboniferous, so that's, you know, sort of around about 300 million years ago, which actually isn't that long ago in the history of the planet, because our planet is 4.6 billion years old. Um, so it's relatively recent. But by that point, you really you're having you have all the kind of uh, cornerstones of ecosystems on land. So you've got your insects, you've got your first tetrapods, so backboned forelimbed animals, um, first trees, although they're not trees as we know them. Uh, I, I think it becomes more recognisable. But yes, the millipedes at that point became enormous. We've got some that were the size of motorbikes. <laughs> uh, these huge creatures and it's because there was an incredibly high uh, atmospheric oxygen level and so it allowed these these animals to grow really enormous so one of the when you say that when you talk about that that period saying it's not very long ago it is worth saying isn't it that evolution kind of from our perspective of creatures that only live about 80 years it seems very slow but when you realize that it's <clears throat> most of the history of the earth was just algae and then <laughs> yeah. it was just it was just a sort of scummy pond with nothing much going on and then suddenly life takes off and virtually everything happens in a, just in the tail end of it mm, and, and, and and it also happens really fast as you were saying when you get the um, the extinctions life bounces back really quickly 
Yeah, it does. You're you're right. When you look at the the entire history of our planet so far, you can you can really sort of segment it into two two halves or halves is not the right word. Two parts before complex life and since complex life. And the before complex life is eighty eight percent of the life of our planet. So complex life has not been around for all that long. And as for us, I mean, we've not even been around for 1% of the time. And we've barely even appeared by, by the Earth standard, by geological time standards. Um, yeah, these are, and these are time skills that are incredibly hard mm. to really envisage, to get our, our heads around. There's a, a little infographic at the start of the book that sort of pictures it to give you an idea. But even then, yeah, look, trying to... Yes. See, look, that yeah. is, uh, that's, that's nothing happening. And then yeah. <laughs> yeah. everything's in exactly. there. <laughs> well, funnily enough, you say that, but what you said earlier is correct, <clears throat> that, that life actually appeared quite quickly, yeah. uh, relatively quickly, sort of within the first possibly as little as a billion years, which is, you know, quite relatively fast, although it doesn't sound like it. But as you, as you say, it was really just single-celled organisms and nothing much else for a huge amount of time. And that's for a number of reasons. I mean, the, the conditions on the planet were, you know, not friendly for anything more complex for a very long time. We didn't have a, we didn't have a nice protective atmosphere. We didn't have all the chemicals that we needed in the ocean, you know, the carbon, the oxygen, things like that. So it just took a long time to accumulate. But once it did, life just went bananas. Um, and you can see that with like within the first, you know, uh, first few slices of geological time, it goes from you know, single-celled organisms to, wow, we've got complex animals, they're coming out of land, they're invading new ecosystems, and they're creating new ecosystems by their actions, by living and dying there. Hmm. I mean, that's one of the very interesting things is that um, you describe creatures that make the world for the rest of the creatures. So, uh, you know, the, the fact that um, you, you, you get a lot of symbiosis and cooperation and um, I think people often think of evolution as just being competition, but that, that sh is that another theme that you, you, you chose? Cause it pops up a lot in the book, the idea of symbiosis and competition. Yeah. I think you, you begin to realize as you look at different organisms that you can't really look at anyone in isolation because really none of them can exist without one another. So, I mean, going back to the mushroom example, I mean, if, if those first um, algae and fungi hadn't, um, basically colonized the land they wouldn't have created the first soils that then allowed plants to develop and of course from plants you then as they begin to die they enrich the soil and you begin to get the insects able to move on to land to feed on that kind mm. of detritus and once they're there of course that means that other animals or fish uh, but certain types of fish begin to want to get up there and eat them too and of course everything just follows everything else and, and yeah it's so interconnected it definitely was a, a very conscious Theme that I wanted to pull out was to show that although you can look at each organism independently, you actually can't separate them. And without without the earlier characters in the book, as it were, you you wouldn't have the later ones. Hmm. Because it, when you get the prototaxites, the, the, the enormously tall fungus, you also get mycorrhizae fungi, and and they wow. without them could the, could the later vascular plants have got started at all? That's a great question. Um, so for, I'm, I'm not sure if everyone will be familiar with, with mycorrhizal fungi. So uh, obviously fungi are kind of absolutely everywhere. I mean, really everything you touch has got fungus on it. Um, but within the soil, if you break open the soil in your garden, you'll often see a kind of whitish uh, film running through it. And that's mycorrhizal fungi. And it tends to, you really find it everywhere. And most plants on our planet rely on the fungi in this this relationship where the fungi will pass nutrients onto them and the plant in exchange gives them nutrients back and many of these plants actually can't thrive and survive without the fungus and vice versa so this is a really good question it's very difficult to tell from the fossil record when this relationship starts and uh, which plants had it and which didn't in the past partly just because it's uh, you know it's, it's such an incredibly fine thing to try and find from the fossil record and we don't have that many places where it would be preserved but um, I mean I suspect this is going to be an incredibly early relationship um, and yeah and it's certainly fundamental to plants now. Is there something about plants which makes this kind of symbiosis or cooperation because you get the same much later with their co-evolution with insects? Mm, I think I think there are certain themes in evolution that do just recur 
over time. So one of them was mass extinctions, like you say, but the other one are these intimate relationships that tend to form. It's almost like nature, if there's a way that, that creatures and plants uh, can find a way to form a relationship, they do, usually because both of them do better out of it. So evolution will favour whatever, whatever makes things survive better. Um, so yes, there is a kind of echoing throughout the book of, you know, here's a really early example of a kind of relationship, but by the time we get a few million years later, here's another relationship that's become a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. And it just goes on like that. Um, of course, until the next mass extinction uh, knocks it back. But you're right, you also mentioned about recovery from extinction. I think this is a really interesting thing too, is how quickly um, life becomes complicated again. Um, it goes, you know, it goes in these kind of waves uh, of, of simpl simplifying after a mass extinction and you get a few survivors that do really well and then very quickly it mounts back up. It seems to be inevitable almost that we have complex ecosystems on the planet. Mm. Um, 